Good evening, and welcome to Behind the Shadows. My name is Susan Finelli, and I am your host and author of Behind the Shadows, a program where we go behind the shadows of what meets the eye. Tonight, we have a very interesting and important topic to discuss. We will be discussing reducing the rate of recidivism in Rikers Island, rehabilitating the incarcerated, and I am pleased that uh, Mark Goldsmith is with us this evening. Mark is the uh, founder of Getting Out and Staying Out. Uh, it's his idea and his formation, and I would like to welcome to you the show this evening. Thank you. It's Thank you so much for being here. Pleasure to be here. And congratulations on your five-year anniversary. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I'm very curious, how did you come up with this idea? Because it's a, a Excuse me, I think it's a wonderful idea. And how did you come up with it? It really evolved, Susan. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an idea I came up with. Mm -hmm. New York has a wonderful program called Principle for the Day. Mm -hmm. It's run by an organization called Pencil. People like you and I and other civically responsible people go into the New York City school system one day a year. Mm -hmm. And you meet with the teachers, you meet with students, and the objective is to have students and faculty understand that we really do care about education in New York City. Right. It's run by a group called PENCIL, and PENCIL mm -hmm. stands for Public Education Needs the Involvement of Civic Leaders. Now, my wife went back to her at grade school, actually, in Richmond Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't do that because I'm from Johnstown, Pennsylvania, originally, <laughs> but I'm a bit of a wise guy. So I went down to PENCIL, and I asked for a tough school. I didn't mm -hmm. want to go to the Upper East Side. I wanted a really tough school. I was sure I was headed for East New York uh -huh. or maybe South Bronx, mm -hmm. and they asked me, would I go to jail? <laughs> I said, okay, I'll go to jail. It turns out at that point in time, there were two schools on Rikers Island, one for adolescents and one for young adults, mm -hmm. and that's the school that I went to. I walked in, and I spent an entire day with the students and the faculty, and at the end of the day, the correction department came to me, and they said, we don't know why they're listening to a guy in a suit, but they're listening to you. What are you telling them? <laughs> well, what I was telling them was that this was not the end of the world, mm -hmm. that they were probably much smarter than they gave themselves credit for. Right. They certainly were not worthless, as many of them thought they were. And if they took the time to think about education, about the fact that there are other jobs in this world besides selling drugs, mm -hmm. that they could make something of themselves and perhaps turn their lives around, maybe be the first person in their family to go to college, and I went back to work. I had spent 35 years in the cosmetic industry, and at that point I was consulting. So I went back to work for a year, and I went back to pencil a year later, and I walked in and they said, well, there's no question where you're going, you're going back to you're jail. You're going to jail. <laughs> they, loved they loved you in jail. They loved so you in jail. So back I went. <laughs> and I met with the principal at that time, Gloria Ortiz, and there was another man there as another principal for the day, a man named Marvin Schechter. Mm -hmm. Marvin had been the head of legal aid in Brooklyn, and he now is a private practitioner. And I'm thinking, why do we need two principals for the day? Well, that's where I put my branding hat on, because I said, Marvin's talking about them getting out of here, I'm talking about them staying out of here. Right. So I, I tucked it away. Mm -hmm. And we had a glorious day, we d it really did well. And at the end of the day, Marvin and I asked the principal, would you like us to come back? Now, at that point, Marvin had a thriving law practice. Yeah. I had a consulting Something business. Practice. So my availability was much more. And I started to go back more often. And I started to develop a passion for working with these young men, uh, which probably is, I think people ask me, well, what does a young man from Johnstown, Pennsylvania have in common with young men from East New York the and South, South Bronx, Bronx. Right, right. What we had in common was that at that age, 18 to 21, I didn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. It was basketball and it was uh, a lot of sports in Western Pennsylvania. I wasn't terribly interested in education. Didn't do that well in high school. Went to Penn State for two years. Didn't do particularly well there either. And went in the Navy and finally came to New York at age 25 and got my act together. Mm -hmm. But I did remember what it was like at 18 to 21. And I was an 18 to 21 year old young man who had a family, yeah. I had a father in, in the house, and I had everything that one could imagine and still didn't have a clue. Still didn't get it right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, still right. Didn't get and it right. so I had something <laughs> in common with them in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that age bracket, which we have stayed with, by mm -hmm. the way, uh, at this point in time, we. Do not work with women. There is a women's facility at Rikers Island. 
Uh, I'd like to work with women someday. It would take a separate program. Why don't you work with women today? Because I feel they require a different type of program. Mm -hmm. Women's needs are quite different than young men. Right. And I also don't work with adolescents because I feel the adolescents are the same way. Mm -hmm. And then our program, which is very one, one built on a, uh, a business model. People have asked me, without your business career, could you have built getting out and staying out? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. No. No. Because as a businessman, I learned how to raise money. I learned about management. I learned about planning, organization, and the like. So that the setting up of a, a not-for-profit, I did have a mentor, my wife. Your wife. Yes. Well, how do you get your funding? Well, that's what I'll get into. Because okay. what happened was uh, I didn't have a clue. Uh -huh. So she sent me down to the Foundation Center where I learned about fundraising. And I learned about what a 501c3 was, which is the tax code for people giving money and getting a tax deduction. And armed with that, uh, I started going back to Rikers more often. And then I set myself up in Starbucks because I couldn't afford an office. <laughs> so I met them at 39th and Park. I, ate, I drank more cafe lattes that year. <laughs> you probably you didn't sleep the whole year. <laughs> <laughs> and it was pretty frustrating. And so that went on for a year and a half. And then I got a foundation uh, large enough to give me enough money to open an office in East Harlem. Mm -hmm. And that was difficult because just getting an office, I was turned down by many buildings until I finally asked the real estate agent, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And it was the beginning of my understanding what it is to deal with the formerly incarcerated. Oh, Landlords were turning me down because they didn't want my clients in the building. Well, how do you I, get them jobs? Well, yeah. I'll, I'll get to that. But the, well, just the whole idea of having to find an office, walk the streets, uh -huh. and get a storefront right. was critical. And so the whole uh, program is based on education. Mm -hmm. Without an education, there are no jobs. Right. Without an education, uh, they are at a tremendous disadvantage in addition to being incarcerated. The program has three spots. There's Rikers Island. Right. There's also upstate because Rikers Island is a holding pen. Right. 14,000 people sleep there every night. Wow, wow. And only 2,000 have been sentenced to less than a year for misdemeanors. The balance of them either have to beat their cases mm -hmm. or they go upstate. So oh, I, I said an upstate, I have an upstate program of correspondence where we write to them and I'm the only not-for-profit that's allowed to actually go into the prisons upstate and write to them afterwards. Mm -hmm. I have a test program with Ohio University, Athens, Ohio. I give yes. one scholarship a year and young men come out with a two-year associate's degree. In fact, my first guy is carrying a, like a 3.9 GPA wow. Wow. at Queens College in electrical engineering. Wow. So, and That's then eventually, <laughs> eventually uh, they get to East Harlem. Well, tell me, when, when you go into the jail, how do the, um, the inmates get introduced to your program? Okay. What happens is they're enrolled in a school. Okay. And that school is where they're going to learn e either their GED or their high school diploma. Mm -hmm. And we work inside the school setting. We go into the classroom right. and we talk about the program and we talk about what they have to do if they're interested. Mm -hmm. First year I let everybody in, big mistake. Second year I said you have to do something. What they have to do is write an essay. Dear Mr. Goldsmith, we've read about your program, I've heard about it, we want to be part of it. Then they sign a contract with me that they will stay in school and they will do certain things while they're in the program. Right. Once they sign up, we get involved in their legal cases. We work with their lawyers, right. whether they're private, 18B, or legal aids. What is 18B? 18B is a lawyer who has a private practice but also works for the city for $75 an hour. Almost pro bono. <laughs> exactly. And those are the guys I worry about. Yeah, yeah. Because if you're there earning 350 an hour working for me and 75 working for my guys. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, 90% uh, of them are pretty darn good mm -hmm. as well as the legal aids mm -hmm. who are just excellent mm -hmm. as well as those who can have uh, hire a private lawyer. But in the courtroom, one thing you have to appreciate is only 10%, less than 10% of those cases go to trial. 90% wow. end up in a plea bargain. And those plea bargains are very tough because they are threatened with long sentences if they don't accept certain uh, guidelines. Conditions. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, my program is not called an ex-offender program, and I'll tell you <laughs> why. A lot of those guys didn't do what they were accused of. In right. fact, I have a contract that says, it said ex-offender on it, and a young man said, I'm not signing that contract. Why not? Interesting. Said, I didn't do it. He didn't do it. He taught me something. He didn't do it. And so we it. talk about yeah. formerly incarcerated or court-involved mm -hmm. young men. Mm -hmm. So they come in. Once they sign up for the program, we see them on a weekly basis. Yes. We see them in group. 
We see them in classrooms and we see them one on one. And what we're looking for them to do is one thing and only one thing. It's an ROI, a return on investment, which right. I learned in the business world. Yes. We are gonna spend time, we're gonna put in effort, and we're gonna spend some money. You, young man, have to invest in yourself. If you're not willing to do that, this will not work. Now let me ask you, when, when an inmate is in your program, right. do they get harassed by other inmates? Do they get dissed by other inmates? They, yes, they can, particularly by the gangs, because the, the gangs. gangs are very strong inside. Yes. And we, we don't talk primarily against gangs. What we say to them is, this is an alternative lifestyle. You, you make the decision. Right. If you want to stay in a gang, fine with me. Mm -hmm. You want to come with us, you really can't be in a gang because you're going to be doing so much that they're not going to be in agreement with, like studying and going to school mm -hmm. and getting a job and working full time. So yes, there, there will be harassment. Uh, what, there's a code inside jails and prisons in that they are not permitted ever to say anything negative about another guy. It's very oh. interesting, and I'll tell you about a case that happened outside in my office. One of the young men was being abusive to the receptionist. In and your office? In my office. Right. And one of my other participants walked over to him and said, listen, we don't act that way at getting out and staying out. Another guy was in the program, didn't say a word. I happened to be on vacation. Uh -huh. I came back. And I called the guy in who had taken the action. I complimented him, and I called the other guy in. Right. And I said, why didn't you do anything? He said, it's not my business. I said, aha. Ah. <laughs> it is your business. Yes. It's your business in the community. Yeah. It's your business in the schoolyard. Because we do want them to become role models mm -hmm. for younger kids so that younger kids don't take the same tact right. that they take. Well, I, I want to tell the audience, I've been to your office up in Harlem, getting out mm -hmm. and staying out. And it's very impressive to see, I mean, there, there happened to be formerly incarcerated gentlemen there mm -hmm. the day that that I was there, and these guys are really, they seem committed. I mean, they're there, they're yeah. serious. Um, they have their box of donuts that they're eating, uh, yeah. uh, but, but... Well, they only get the donuts inside. Inside, <laughs> they only get the That's donuts. That's my treat. <laughs> That's your no, treat. They, uh, there's, a, there's a comfort zone there mm -hmm. that they have, and a trust, which right. is everything. You have to remember, these guys come from a world that you and I can't possibly imagine. Nothing is permanent in their lives so that the mere permanence of getting out and staying out, if we have a template on our w website of how to start a getting out and staying out, and at the bottom of each column it says one thing, keep showing up. Right. Keep showing up. Right. That will be very new to them, and they don't really get it at the beginning. I'm asked questions, why are you here? Mm -hmm. Why aren't you out playing golf? What are you doing here with me? Because I'm, I'm, and so I have to explain why I'm there and what we expect of them when they are inside, when they're upstate, and when they get out. But that trust and confidence that they have in our staff, mm -hmm. in our coaches, right. other retired senior volunteers come with me to Rikers Island, mm -hmm. uh, and they are an, an integral part of this. They're both highly successful businessmen. Uh, Tim Lasante, who is the assistant commissioner uh, in the Department of Education for the division that we're in, thinks it is, and I, I believe it is, the only program in America where businessmen go inside to a jail and prison on a continual basis every single week. Right. Well, I know you have a motto, yard by yard, it's hard, inch by inch, it's a cinch. You got that right. <laughs> you got that right? right. Because what we're looking for them is to achieve successes because remember, their lives up to that point, they have left school in eighth or ninth grade. Mm -hmm. They have never known anything but truancy. They come from uh, families that are terribly broken. Uh, a lot of foster care, uh, a lot of adoption, being shunted from shelter to shelter. And so that mere permanence and the fact that we're there for them once again, they have to be there for themselves. For themselves. And if they're not, we ask them to do something every step of the way. Mm -hmm. I mentioned about investing time and effort and money. We spend $45,000 a year on Metro cards, but mm -hmm. every card is signed for. If they go to school and work full time, they get a monthly. I see. Unfortunately, that's it's, going it's up. That's going up. <laughs> have to redo the that's budget. Go, you have to redo the right. budget and get but, out there some uh, more funding. <laughs> let me tell you about my toolkit. <laughs> yes, let's talk the, about your toolkit. The kit. very first day, because we don't have much time here. Mm -hmm. Once they get out, they want action. Mm -hmm. They are not. They don't have a lot of patience. 
yes. for everything. So what we do is in the very first day they walk in, there's an intake process where we make sure they have the proper IDs. They immediately get a psychosocial done by our social services department, and that's very important to learn about whatever problems they may have, their living situation, whatever addictions they might have, anger management and the like. Then they come up and they work with career managers. The career managers talk to them about education and jobs. They then talk to a job developer, somebody who actually will get more specific with them. Right. But on the very first day, they leave with a new resume. Now, you can imagine after 35 years, <laughs> I know how to do you a resume. You know how to write a resume. Right. And the most important thing they have to learn how to do is to put off the books jobs on a resume. Why not? Yes. They're very important. Exactly. And a lot of their jobs have been off, off the books. Off the books. Do you have illegal the, immigrants that... Uh, uh, occasionally. Occasionally. That's a very difficult situation because of 9-11. Yes. It's, I mean, yeah. there's, there's no mercy shown to these guys. No, so it's very no. difficult. Yeah. Uh, I imagine it's difficult to get employers to embrace your program. It is not easy. It's not easy. I'll so if there are employers bit. out there, yeah. uh, contact uh, well, Lock. Uh, no question about that. No question about but that. Let me tell you about that toolkit again. So we, yes. they get, they get uh, the new resume. They do the resume themselves on mm -hmm. the computer. They get Metro cards. They get shirt, tie, pants, and we order a pair of shoes for them. Right? We give them enough condoms they need for, for safety, and we give them paper, pencil, and they know that they can actually go out and start looking for a job the next day. Right. But we know that's somewhat unrealistic. Mm -hmm. So we run seminars, intensive seminars. It's no surprise people who know me know that I run a time and priority management <laughs> seminar. But then I we, may have to come to one of those uh, seminars. Uh, <laughs> you know, I talk to my wife and kids about that. That's, <laughs> that's another whole thing. That's uh, it for another show. <laughs> But then we run interviewing techniques and we actually uh, videotape them mm -hmm. because there's nothing like a video to show. Uh, and a young woman who's in the corporate world comes in and does that. We have financial planning. Mm -hmm. We just made an arrangement with TD Bank where they actually are getting uh, bank accounts. Oh, and because good. this is the, the very simple basics mm -hmm. that they need. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have fatherhood initiatives. We're starting a new one on relationships with women, oh. <laughs> which is a serious problem yes. for them. Yeah. Many of them have never seen a healthy relationship yes. with a woman. So yeah. uh, that's uh, another issue. So we try and deal with the issues that they're going to run into. As far as the hiring process, there's no question that they are diff much more difficult to place. However, yes. we don't ask, we're not looking for charity, we're not saying give them a break. What we're saying is we will give you a well-trained employee who will tell you that he is hardworking, he is always on time, and he doesn't believe in sick days. <laughs> and that's the three things that my guys say on every single interview. Mm -hmm. Because they don't appreciate the fact that on an entry level position, what is the boss looking for? He's looking for you to be on time. Right. He's looking for you to work hard and don't take sick days. Yes. Uh, my first job out of uh, college, I was actually starting graduate school, was with Pfizer. They had just bought Cody, a perfume house. I didn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. I talked myself from a $6,000 job a year to $12,000. I didn't have a clue. <laughs> so I just started coming but in. But you were there on time. <laughs> no, I was in 7 o'clock. Oh. And I didn't leave till 7 o'clock. <laughs> and I did that for six months mm -hmm. until I got transferred into the marketing department. Mm -hmm. And then my career took off by being hired by Revlon and uh, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. But they, that's, that's what they have to learn they how to, to do. Learn. Let me ask you, can... Um, People that are already out that did not know about your program while they were in, can they come to you for assistance? As long as you've been incarcerated at Rikers Island. I see. Uh, for less than, and less than three years if you've gone upstate? Is I'm that sorry, it? If, if you've gone upstate? If you've gone, our, our ages are 18 to 24. Okay. So you have to have entered the program before your 25th birthday. Then I it doesn't matter how old you are. You can be 25, I 26, see. 27. We're going to start experimenting in the fall with 17-year-olds, okay. with a little trepidation, but we're going to try to see if the 17-year-olds can step up, and it's going to be our first foray into that. Now, and is it the immaturity level? Exactly. Is that what it They're is? Not, yeah. yeah. For the most part, the adolescent is not ready to step mm -hmm. up for themselves. Before long, you end up enabling. You end mm -hmm. up doing things for them instead of having them do themselves. Mm -hmm. Plus, they haven't been burned quite badly enough yet, some of them. But we would do. We do want to test the waters, and mm -hmm. we will do that starting in September. Now, your your success rate is 
tremendous. Is it 80% well, success? Well, at this point in time, Rikers has their recidivism down close to 50%. Mm -hmm. When we started, it was over 60. It's now slightly over 50. Ours is well under 20. Well under 20. Uh, we do lose some. Mm -hmm. There's no question we do. Uh, one of the things that's very difficult when you get out is parole and probation. Mm -hmm. The way it is set up, 75% of all parole and probation violations are nonsense. They are things like missing a meeting with your parole officer, right. being out after a curfew, walking over a state line for 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And for that, they get sent back. They up. get sent back. They get sent back. And so what we do is we started a program working with parole and probation so that we have the name of every parole officer and every probation officer. And we get them to understand that this is serious business. Yes. And, it, and you really don't want to get violated. It's not that they're out committing new crimes. Right. Very few of the violations are new crimes. They're sloppy. Exactly. They're sloppy. Exactly. Let me ask you this. So if, so if someone is in your program and they get paroled after nine months, whatever it is, they go through oh, you. Three, five well, years. Three, five years, yeah. <laughs> whatever it is. They get paroled. Yes. They complete your program successfully. Right. We never close the door. You know, so if, what happens if they wind up back inside? Can they go back yes, to the program? Yes, absolutely. We never give up on them. Even if they're over the 24-year-old? Even if they're over, as long as they started. So we, as long we, as they started. We have an open-door policy see. with respect to that. And I get many calls from guys who have been gone for years, mm -hmm. particularly on a Saturday morning, because I work Saturday mornings, right. and they'll call. And they're really calling just to see if I'm still there. <laughs> uh, we have young, um, our, our graduates are phenomenal. We have one young man, uh, John, who is just an incredible young man who uh, had a serious drug problem, uh, got out, had trouble getting his GED, finally got his GED. He was embarrassed in court one day with a New York judge who told him he'll never get his GED. He's not smart enough, can oh. you imagine? Oh. At which time the lawyer looked at her like she was nuts and said, Your Honor, I have ADD. If it was up to you, I wouldn't be a lawyer. <laughs> I wouldn't be here. John uh, got himself a job driving, uh, has then uh, moved to uh, New Jersey or Pennsylvania now, and is moving up in the world. He got himself, he bought a house. Good for him. For his wife and child. Uh, living in New Jersey Wonderful. and doing extremely well. Right. Uh, other young men, uh, had one young man uh, was interested in being as in the cement business. Mm -hmm. And so what we run our seminars also on the construction business. How do you get in the union? And this young man probably makes about $83,000 a year as a cement worker. Other young man wanted to be a nurse. So mm -hmm. he's at Queens College. He got himself a job at a major hospital in New York just in maintenance. Right. But in maintenance, he was able to see the job listings. Yes. What we try and get them to understand is get that entry level Get position. your foot in the door. Exactly. Get your foot in and the door. And when you're there, impress. Now, we have some guys. I had a guy working in one of the lo largest law firms in New York. And uh, one week after he was there, he was about to get fired. <laughs> so I called him in. I said, oh, I know that guy, the head of the That mail. creep, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. I said to him, Let's talk. The guy who you're calling a creep has been there 15 years. Right. You've been there five days, <laughs> and he's your boss. Let's do the math. You have a choice. <laughs> I'm not going to. I said, well, you have a choice. Aren't you making $14 an hour yeah. in that mail room, and you were pushing burgers at seven and a quarter? He said, yes. I said, well, if you can't handle a guy like that at this level, you can't handle anything, so you make your own mind up. Do what you want to do. Is it the rebellion? Wait, wait, let me finish. One year later, uh -huh. he was still there. He was still there. So I called him in, and I said, what's happening? He said, guy's a wise guy. <laughs> he, he wasn't going to bounce me out of there. Mm -hmm. But see, a lot of guys never have that meeting with me, yes. and they get fired because they're always being dissed. Right. Well, they're paying their dues. They're gophers. They're go gophers. for this, go for that. Exactly. And they don't like that, so that we try and train right. them. But is it do. is it a rebellion because when they're when they're inside they have to walk the line and do everything people tell them to do and then when they out it's, it's they get out it's that it's all, the, all this bravado stuff uh -huh. and we talk to them about that a lot right. their decision making process is awful yes they make very bad decisions mm -hmm. and those are the decisions that get them into trouble and w what we do is we do role playing and so I would say to you let's go we're gonna play cards in Brooklyn tonight I'll pick you up in my car at 8 o'clock on the corner 161st and River and you say okay now you know what I have in that car mm -hmm. you know right. I never go anywhere without what's in that car right are you going in the car 
And the guy will say, yes. I said, how can you go in the car? You know it's in the car. And sure enough, the car gets stopped for a blinking light. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, he's up against you're the wall. Handcuffs. And he's back in Rikers. Exactly. Or you're walking down the street with your buddies and you're going to school. And you know what they're carrying. And you know where they're going. And you, of course, you're carrying your books. And they slam you up against the wall. And they announce, you're the lookout. Mm -hmm. They always have a nerd, you know, some guy with glasses, exactly. with books, and you're <laughs> exactly. the nerd. Yeah. So we try and get them to understand that those are the decisions that they have to make up front. They've got to be proactive instead of reactive. If they stay reactive, they're just going to keep getting locked up. Well, it's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle. And also, I, I can imagine the home life is a vicious cycle. So there is no home life. There is no home there life. There is no home life. The, the home life is almost non-existent. The home life is what got them there to begin with. To begin with. with. Exactly. And so when they go back into those homes, and it's a very sad situation. As I said, there are very few male role models. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a difficult time for the whole family. It's a very serious situation. Well, we're almost out of time. I have one more question mm -hmm. to ask you. Do other states come to you and say, hey, show us how this works? Uh, we get letters from all over the country uh -huh. uh, because I won something called the Purpose Prize a yes. few years ago. Yes. And that's when I became, the program became very well known. In fact, uh, I'll be speaking, uh, we've actually got invited to Germany. Ah. I'll be in Hamburg in next month to talk Great. about the program. Great. The whole idea is a larger concept, it's run by Civic Ventures, and right. the idea being that p people who are retiring in their mm -hmm. 60s mm -hmm. can give back. The idea is to find to out find something, out. what you can give back. Well, Mark, I wish we could stay here all night and discuss this because it's a wonderful topic. You're a wonderful guest. But unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank you for coming in and sharing your wisdom with us and for educating and for educating us. Uh, I think it's a wonderful topic. I thank our audience for tuning in tonight. Uh, if there's a topic you would like us to discuss, you can contact me at susan at behindtheshadows.com. And uh, if you've missed any of our programs, you can go to my website at www.behindtheshadows.com and click on Public Access Television. And until next time, remember, the brightest light shines behind the shadows. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. My pleasure. My pleasure.